Hello and good morning if you are on the West Coast. My name is Carrie Jorgensen and I am a college counselor here at ESM. I've been part of the ESM team for the last three admission cycles and prior to joining ESM I had a career as a high school counselor, worked in high schools for about 10 years and also spent two seasons reading for the UC system, first for UC Santa Cruz and then for UC Berkeley. So I come to you um, really from having worked on all sides of the proverbial desk and want to share my wisdom as it relates to seniors specifically. Um, senior year is such an exciting time in a 17, 18 year old's life. Um, it's really the, you know, the last of their, um, their formal education from, you know, K to 12. They've in some cases been with the same group of students since they were just kindergartners in other cases, you know, um, maybe this is a high school experience where a student has been with this group of, of friends and teachers for the last four years. Um, everybody comes at it from a unique angle, but the common denominator is that it's a uh, crossroads for change. Um, and so with that can come some anxiety, of course, and just kind of facing the unknown. So my goal today is really to just um, provide some advice and some, some timely tips per month for seniors and any parents who are tuning in today. All right, just trying to figure out how to move my screen here. Oh, excuse me. Okay. All right. So first off, I wanted to define the support system. Um, obviously, at this point in a student's high school career, there's many individuals that really care about a student and their, their success. Um, and kind of defining who those people are is an important step in this process. So of course, um, we encourage our students to really depend on their parents, keep an open dialogue. Oftentimes, you know, Parents can have one idea of what makes a balanced college list for a student or hopes and dreams for their students, while students might have a completely different idea. So really opening up those lines of communication between students and parents is really key at this point in the process. Um, we know that parents are often the ones writing the tuition checks and know their students best. So as college counselors here at ESM, we always keep parents in the loop. Um, but for any students listening right now, make sure that you are keeping your parents in the loop because they're your biggest cheerleaders through this whole process. Um, most often, students have a, a designated college counselor at their high school. Um, I can't underscore the importance of getting to know that person. That is the person who will be writing your letter of recommendation that will then be sent off to all of your colleges. And it's really the person who's your champion at school, the person who should be helping you, um, you know, balance your college list in conjunction with an outside counselor, potentially, um, and also the person who will be ultimately sending out your transcripts and uh, what's called a secondary school report. And it's just a great idea to lean on your school counselor because they um, that's their entire job is to support you and your college application process. Um, some high schools uh, actually have a designated school counselor as well. Um, and that's somebody who usually focuses on academic and personal support for a student. This can be a stressful time. It can be tricky to, to manage um, time as well as just overall anxiety around the process. So if your school has a school counselor that's designated to helping in that sort of capacity, we also definitely encourage um, our students to lean on school counselors as well. Um, teachers are certainly part of the support system, not only the teachers that you have uh, in your classes right now, um, and keeping good rapport there so that you can hopefully earn the highest grades possible in that fall term of your senior year, um, but also the teachers that will be writing uh, letters of recommendation for students. It's really important to lean on those teachers, make sure you continue to have a solid rapport and um, you know keep in, keep in touch more on that in, in just a moment. Um, older siblings, a lot of times, if you're if you're lucky enough to have had an older sister or brother go through the college application process, I'm sure there are words of wisdom and encouragement that they can share with you. So I wouldn't hesitate to ask an older sibling or maybe a friend's older sibling if they have any best practices or tips about the process. Um, and then 
I think uh, any any older sibling would probably share the, the single best piece of advice is do not procrastinate in this process. Be the best project manager that you can possibly be. Um, and then this last one is definitely worth mentioning, um, leaning on non-competitive friends. I've seen it um, in my work in high schools and then now on the, the private side of counseling that it can be a grueling process for some students. Um, some students really don't feel comfortable sharing their college list with their greater friend group. And that's completely okay. Um, if you want to lean on, you know, a really trusted friend to let them know where you're applying, go for it. But if you also feel like keeping that information private, because it is very unique and private to you, um, we encourage you to do that as well. Um, I think it's really easy to fall into the pattern of, you know, comparing yourself based off your GPA and your test scores and your extracurriculars and where you're applying early decision and where you're not. Um, and that is just a really slippery slope that ends up um, honestly hurting students. So I I always encourage my students to kind of keep it to themselves. And then once all the decisions are out, if you want to shout it from the rooftops, you know, where you're ultimately going to college, absolutely, you know, wear that sweatshirt and be proud about that. But um, it's usually just something that's better kept between a student and their family and then maybe one very close trusted friend. So this one, um, I wanted to take a moment to just kind of address for parents and students listening. I found that it's best for students and parents to really define a specific time and place um, for them to be able to talk about college and the college applications. Students have enough on their plate with their extracurriculars, their classes, and then now college applications that they don't want to be talking about it every single day at the dinner table. In fact, that can just cause undue stress for students. So I like to kind of use the example of ice cream sundae. Um, maybe, you know, a student loves a certain ice cream shop in their neighborhood. And maybe every Sunday, you and your student can find 30 to 45 minutes, go to that ice cream shop, get your favorite ice cream and use that time to talk about what's coming up for the week with regards to college applications. And that's it. I know it is so tempting to want to talk about it all the time and to really helicopter over the process, but this is truly the student's time to shine. The more ownership that a student and uh, their private college counselor can take over in the process, the, the more authentic it is and really the better results we see. Um, of course, we want parent involvement. That is an important piece of the puzzle, but really just knowing when to uh, talk about it and when not to talk about it is really important. So have that frank conversation with each other. Parents bring this up to your students. Students bring this up to your parents and define, you know, okay, we can talk about it Sunday afternoons and Tuesdays at dinner and that's it. And that's, you know, we some families I've had, they call it the C word, right? Like we don't bring up the C word unless it's the designated time. So figure out a communication pattern that works for you and your family and know that this is a pretty important rule to stick by um, because it can just start to feel really, really cumbersome um, and stressful. And so um, putting some boundaries on the communication patterns is, is something we really um, advise for our students. So August, can't believe it's already come and gone. Here we are. Today is September 6, 2023. Um, what we would hope a student would have accomplished last month is really defining the college list. Um, I often tell my students that the college list drives the entire process, and it's true. Once you have the list of maybe 12 to 15 schools defined, then you know what direction to move in in terms of your to-do list. Um, with the college list comes strategy, and that means identifying application plans. Um, it's not the right, it, it doesn't, this doesn't work for every student, but sometimes a strategy that does work is defining an early decision school for, as a reminder, early decision is the one that's binding. So if you apply early and you're accepted, you are expected to go to that institution. And so if you are gonna do an early decision application plan, those applications tend to be due uh, November 1st, November 15th timeframe. 
Um, and so by defining the early decision school, then you can build out all the other schools around that and sprinkle in a couple of early action schools, which means you're applying early, finding out early, but it's not binding. And then also having the longer plan and strategy where if you don't get into your early decision first choice school, which schools are you going to apply to in the regular rounds? And the regular rounds take place in January. Um, so just having kind of that strategy in place and knowing kind of where you as an applicant stand um, and chances for uh, for each of those schools is an important thing to identify in August. So you go in with a plan and you also know, you know, which applications to really do and in what order, um, you know, if, say you have an early decision school, a couple early action schools and the rest are regular we don't want you spending too much time fine tuning and polishing your regular applications and essays just yet. That will still happen this fall, but we don't want you doing that um, first thing in the fall. Instead, we want you to really focus on your personal statement, finalizing your testing plan, um, and any supplemental writing for your very first application that's due. So speaking of testing, um, just a reminder, there are a couple more test dates available in the fall. Most colleges want for students to uh, finish and wrap up testing, usually by December at the very latest. Um, so the SAT has three upcoming dates. Uh, there's October 7th, November 4th, and December 2nd. So if your student um, who if you are a student who has taken the test maybe once or twice and you feel like you've got the time and the bandwidth to prep a little bit more and you want to try and see if you can inch that score up, absolutely. I would try to register today if you can. Space does fill up very quickly in some geographic regions. Um, and then give yourself the best chance possible to get the highest test score possible. Your college counselor at ESM or at school can help you identify which test scores to send to which schools based off of um, kind of the historical data that will um, help help you pull up on uh, what's called the middle 50% for either the SAT or the ACT. But um, you know, registering for those tests and having a testing final testing plan in place is really an important thing to determine first, first step of senior year. Uh, for the ACT, the upcoming dates are actually this weekend, September 9th then um, October 28th and December 9th. Um, so like I said, if you're still planning to test, please register um, and then define your testing plan. So once you have your full battery of test scores back and you know exactly which test scores you plan to submit to your colleges, identifying which colleges you actually plan to submit the scores for and which you plan to go test optional for. And that's a really great strategic um, piece to, to leverage and something that you should be talking to either your ESM counselor about or your college counselor at school so that we can help you, um, you know, put your best foot forward for each individual application. By now, I would have hoped that all students have in the senior year have created their common application account. Um, it's really important to have that account up and running and really be filling out as much as you possibly can on the common app. Um, the Common App itself, there's, you know, one main tab where all colleges will receive um, that same central common information. Um, it's really not too difficult. A lot of it will honestly feel like filling out a form for a doctor. It's a lot of demographic information. And then using your counselor at school or your ESM counselor to really review it and strategize is the best approach. Um, but right now, if you haven't started your Common App account, now would be the perfect time. Carve out some time this weekend and really fill out as much of that Common App tab as you possibly can. And um, I forget that I need to define things um, for, for viewers. So the Common App is a the um, central place where most colleges house their application. I think there's over a thousand colleges right now on the Common App. Um, and so Common App is a tool in an application system, most likely every student will be using, and it is how you will be submitting your, your application to majority of your colleges. Um, colleges will see that are on the Common App will see all the common information on there, as well as the school specific, what we call supplemental information. So Duke, for instance, is on the Common App. Duke has their own set of questions that they ask that just Duke will receive, and then they also receive all of the central Common App information. 
Um, next up would be an essay doc. This is something we swear by here at ESM. Um, we set it up with a grid at the top. It will have the list of colleges, the application strategy and plan. So are you applying early action, early decision, rolling, regular? Um, we also include interview information since that is something that some colleges do, um, do either require or strongly recommend that their applicants uh, pursue. And, and that can be an active process of actually signing up for an interview on a college's website. Um, and then we also keep track of, you know, the associated dates and deadlines in that grid. And then underneath the grid, we will house all of the specific essay questions based off the student's college list. So every student is going to be writing a personal statement that's a 650 word essay on um, typically a topic of the student's choice, um, but that really highlights kind of the heartbeat and the values of who the student is. And then they have to write supplemental essays. And that can range from one question, such as, you know, why do you want to attend this college, up to like six, seven, or eight specific questions that the college will want to know about the student. Um, so the writing can be kind of intense. And we really suggest that you have everything on one document so that there's a central place for the student. And then you can start to kind of understand patterns like, okay, this college is asking this question, which sounds like a lot like the, the other college's question. And then you can um, just recycle and uh, revamp the essays according to word count and maybe tweak it a little bit depending on the specific college. Um, at this point in the process, we really would want students to be brainstorming on their personal statement and having a rough draft. Um, my goal for my students is really to typically have rough drafts in August and then September is like polishing and then you're done. You're done with the main uh, showcase showcasing piece of writing and then you're really working on your supplements. Um, supplements is a great way to bring an application alive and to help students kind of elaborate maybe on a specific activity or something they really care about um, and uh, getting all those outlined sooner than later is definitely advisable. So moving on to September, here we are. Um, by now, the personal statement is hopefully finalized. Um, it's worth pausing to talk about the activities list. So the Common App asks for students to write about up to 10 activities that they've been involved with over the course of their four years of high school. And these can be school-related activities or activities that they've pursued outside of um, their high school. And really, it's just a way for colleges to get a sense of who the student is aside from aside from their transcript. Um, I personally think that the activities list is one of the most crucial pieces of the application because it helps really set the tone and tell the college like what the student cares about and how you, how you spend your time. Um, so finalizing your activities list, generating the list of ideas, hobbies absolutely count, internships count, things the student's done over the summer, um, any kind of clubs, sports, church involvement, family responsibilities. Um, every activities list that I've worked on with students really takes its own unique shape. And it's a way for a student to kind of show personality. Um, within the activities list, you're listing the activity and then you have um, 150 characters to tell the college about that activity. That's about the equivalent of two sentences or a tweet uh, back when, when tweets were capped. So, you know, taking the time to really um, think through the activities list and put it in a strategic order makes a lot of sense at this point in the process. Um, we also want students to start to think about what other application platforms they need to start working on. So say you have your list of 12 or so colleges, maybe um, nine of those colleges are on the Common App. The student plans to apply to the UC system, which is one application, and, and um, then you check the box for which UC school you plan to apply to. Um, perhaps the student, if you're a West Coast student or interested in coming to a Cal State, like Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo or San Diego State, you'll be applying directly through what's called Cal State Apply. Or perhaps you're going to be doing a college specific application. The two kind of name brand schools that tend to um, draw students to college to their college specific application are Georgetown 
and MIT. Um, both Georgetown and MIT are not housed on the common application. So it's pretty common for a student of mine to have maybe two to three application platforms that they're working across. So that means two to three places where you have a unique username and password, you're filling out all the demographic information for each application, and you have specific essays for each of those application platforms. Um, so a combination could be, you know, the common application, the UC application, and then the Georgetown application. Um, UCAS is for schools in the United Kingdom, and that is its own application platform as well and could be applicable for some students. Um, at this point in September, it's a really good idea to draft what's called the personal insight questions or PIQs. Those questions are asked by the University of California. Um, the UC provides applicants with eight different questions, and then applicants are required to answer four of those eight questions. Um, our essay coaches here at ESM have a, a pretty great process where normally they'll actually have the students, regardless if they're applying to the UC, answer those questions first when they're starting their supplemental writing. Um, the questions are just open-ended and really elicit um, great responses from students. So it can be helpful to write those write those essay responses and then kind of tweak and see where those responses could fit in for the rest of your supplemental questions, regardless if you're actually applying to the UCs. And if you just do a quick Google search, UC personal insight questions, the UC has some great material out there. You'll be able to uh, quickly download a PDF and see exactly what the questions are. And then they even have really great insight into like, what does that question actually mean? What are they, what are they actually asking the student? Um, we also would want for, at, in September, students to be confirming their recommendation plans. So most colleges, um, the notable exceptions are the UCs and Cal State Apply, are going to be requiring recommendations. They not only want to hear the student's voice through the application and the personal statement and the supplements, they also really want to hear from the student's teachers and counselors. And so kind of our rule of thumb here at ESM is to have Students ask two recommenders, two teachers from school that really know who they are as a student. It doesn't have to be a, a teacher that you necessarily got like an A plus grade in, but somebody who could maybe speak to your growth throughout that class, your academic uh, curiosity, who you are as an academic student and a classmate and what kind of energy you bring to the overall classroom dynamic. So confirming um, plans with recommenders is really important in September. Most schools have a process where students have to fill out what's called a questionnaire, provide additional information for the recommenders, and then the recommender will take that questionnaire and write a thoughtful recommendation. Counselors also write recommendations. Um, I remember spending my summers between each school year writing beautiful recommendations to really highlight my students in, a, in the most thoughtful way. The counselor recommendations really are more... Um, you know, the, the teacher ones are more specific to that class, whereas the counselor ones really highlight the student holistically. Who is that student on our high school campus? Um, where, you know, where have they made an impact and a splash? And um, really kind of getting at the overall kind of um, heartbeat of who the student is. And that's what the responsibility of the high school counselor's recommendation um, is. So checking in with your recommenders, staying in good communication, making it as easy as possible for your recommenders and really like being thoughtful with the questionnaire, checking in, and of course, thanking them. Um, most high schools use some sort of platform to keep track of the college applications that a student's applying to, and then also use a platform to actually submit and transmit transcripts letters of recommendation, and secondary school reports. And those platforms include, um, I'll just name a couple. There's Naviance, there's Score, College Kickstart. Um, there's one called Maya Learning. So there's a few platforms out there that really, um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with these names, that's okay. But be sure to ask your, your counselor at school if there is a platform that your high school uses. And if so, what is it? And be sure to be dialed into that. Um, essentially, what is really important that I'll do with a lot of my students is say their their school uses SCORE. I'll have the student pull up their SCORE account. I'll have them pull up their Common App account, as well as their other application platforms, and make sure everything aligns. Um, 
because we want to make sure that all colleges that a student applies to on the Common App are also in their score account and score and Common App are linked. And so um, it's just really, really important to keep that list nice and tight and completely updated at all times. Um, checking in with the school counselor, could not recommend that more. Have that meeting, let the, the counselor know what your plans are. If you're planning to apply an early decision to any school that does require three signatures, one from you, the student, one from the parent, and one from the school counselor. So you have to keep your counselor in the loop so that you can get that signature and then also so that your counselor can send off the necessary documents at, um, using the right timetable. I also would really like my students at this juncture to be drafting their early round supplements. Um, so any college where they're applying early action, early decision are rolling, have those supplements in draft form so that next month you can start to submit. Um, and then researching specific school interview policies. Um, your counselor at ESM should be um, well aware of what those policies are and helping you kind of sift through that. If not, you can certainly always do a Google search for the specific college and ask for um, and gather some information as to how they do interviews. And a quick note on interviews, um, like a lot of the Ivy Leagues will just have a student opt in through the Common App and say that they wanna be considered in the interview pool. And then it's up to the discretion of the college if they actually want to interview the students. Um, and then the student would be invited specifically to do that. Georgetown, on the other hand, just throwing out an example here, they require that all applicants complete an interview. And the way that a, a student um, kind of gets in the queue, if you will, to do that is they have to complete the first part of the Georgetown application. And then that will put them into the queue. Um, the Georgetown application is split into two different parts and you have to complete part one, which is basically a demographic form. And then it puts the student into the interview queue and a student will definitely be contacted by the school, um, by Georgetown, by an alumni to conduct an interview at some point throughout the application process. And we do provide, you know, interview prep and coaching for our students here at ESM as well. Okay, looking ahead to next month, October, what should students be doing? Really working through that Common App in terms of data entry, making sure everything is in there accurately, words are capitalized, um, every T is cropped and I is dotted, all the data entry is perfect and up to par. We also want for students to really be finalizing their plans. Um, just so you know, there are two typical colleges that students will apply to with October 15th deadlines. Uh, the first is University of Georgia, and then the second is UNC. Um, so, you know, the Bulldogs and the Tar Heels often make counselors kind of pull their hair out because it's like, oh my gosh, it's time to apply already and it's only October 15th. But at the end of the day, I actually don't mind at all when a student does have those colleges on their list because it really forces us to move our timeline up a little bit sooner and there's nothing wrong with being ahead of the game. Um, with regards to the college admission process. So October 15th is probably the earliest that a student would be submitting applications unless it's rolling, which as a reminder means that you apply. And as soon as your application gets into the hands of the college, they start to review it and then they roll back a decision within four to six weeks. Um, the next deadline is November 1st and then November 15th. And those are kind of the early rounds. There's also a couple of colleges out there that have December 1st. Um, but generally, if you're applying October 15th, November 1st, November 15th, um, you want to have your ducks in a row about two weeks ahead of the application deadline. So for some students, that means in the next you know, three and a half weeks or so, their applications are nearly finalized and ready to be submitted. Um, we also want for students right after you hit submit. Um, I just had a student submit uh, an application to Loyola Chicago, which is a rolling application system. Um, through the Common App, and they have already received what's called a, access to their portal account. So after a student applies to college, um, they get an email usually within 24 to 48 hours confirming receipt of the application and then inviting them to set up what's called a portal account. The portal is where the student can keep track of their application. It's a unique username and password specific to the student. And it is where the student can see, okay, look, uh, it looks like my counselor submitted my transcript, my teacher submitted my, my 
letters of recommendation. They have everything they need to be able to make a decision. And then eventually de the decision is released through the portal count account. Sometimes colleges will still send the big envelope with the happy news inside, like when I was a senior in high school. But a lot of times they're releasing it online through the portal account. So just know that that's the last step after a student applies to a college is you have to set up that portal account. I cannot recommend enough to create a, a document with every link to every portal account and every username and password, and then check those accounts every single week because you don't want to miss something as an applicant. Um, that's how the colleges will be communicating with you if they need anything more from you as an applicant. Um, for those of you applying for financial aid, starting in October, October 1st, you can begin completing what's called the FAFSA or the CSS profile. Um, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. It is free and it is something that you can complete. The parent and the student need to be involved in this process. And if you want to be considered for any need-based financial aid, you absolutely need to complete the FAFSA. We also recommend that families, if you want to be considered for merit aid, you complete the FAFSA as well. And then some colleges require what's called the CSS profile, which is an additional application. It does have a fee associated with it. I believe it's $25 per school. And it is a way for the college to capture a more in-depth financial picture of what you and your family's finances look like. Um, but application season kicks off on October 1st for financial aid. And it's important to submit those forms sooner than later. Um, oftentimes you have until early March for the FAFSA and then the CSS profile um, deadlines can vary from college to college. So a good rule of thumb for me and my, my families is to submit the FAFSA or the CSS profile really by December 1st, mid-December at the latest. Um, I'd also want for you to be checking in with your recommenders and thank them. A lot of them by the end of October will have written your letter of rec and spent probably an hour and a half to three hours on your recommendation. It's a lot of time for a very busy teacher and counselor. So be sure to be thoughtful send them a note, thank them for their support of your application and keep them in the loop. Um, you also want to continue to follow up your, your school counselor, see if anything is needed on your end. Uh, continue testing, perhaps. There's that SAT on October 7th and the ACT on October 28th. Um, and then really starting on the regular round supplemental essays. Um, this might seem counterintuitive because, wait, I don't know if I need to apply to regular schools because I applied early decision and I'm hoping to get that application decision back in mid-December. So why would I draft regular round essays? Our rule of thumb, do it. In this world we live in, there is no guarantees and we would rather have a student have the writing finished in a thoughtful manner um, without panicking over their winter break than, than not. So continue the momentum, don't lose steam and keep writing. November. So the UC application is due on November 30th. Um, in my world, that means November 20th. I do not want to be spending my Thanksgiving and nor do my students or families fine tuning the UC application. So look at the deadline as November 20th and work on finalizing the writing for the UC application and inputting all the demographic information that's required as well as the activities. The one thing to note that's different about the UC application than the common application is the UC allows for students to submit up to 20 different activities um, and you actually have more character count. It's 350 characters versus 150 characters. So just know that you can elaborate a little bit more on the UC, which is a good thing because UCs don't take letters of recommendation. And so hearing more from the student's voice is essential because there's nobody else who's gonna be talking about the student in the application. Um, you want to be finalizing and submitting your UC and Cal State applications. Uh, quick note on the Cal State applications, those don't open until October 1st. And so in October and November, that's when students are submitting the Cal States. Those applications are really straightforward. Um, it can be a little bit complicated to put in the coursework, but there's no writing. They do not take essays or test scores or anything like that. So you know, as long as the student inputs their classes correctly, and that's a great thing to have a school counselor check over, um, it can be an application that can be completed in about two, three hours. Um, we also want our students to be really finalizing their regular round supplemental essays, um, potentially working on what's called a continued interest letter. 
um, which means that if a student is deferred from an early round, meaning the college says, you know what, we're not ready to say no, but we're also not ready to say yes. We want to see your fall grades. So we're going to defer you into the regular round, and then you'll find out a firm decision from us usually in February or March. You want to write what's called a continued interest letter. And so that's a letter letting the colleges know, hey, thank you so much for considering my application in the early round. Here's what I've been up to since I last, you know, since I hit submit back in October. And so that's why it's really important for students to keep their grades up and to really keep at it in terms of their uh, community involvement and activities, because you want to be able to have material to talk about in these continued interest letters. Um, and continue working on developing your activities and gaining leadership roles and having momentum across the board. Um, following through with interviews in the event that you've signed up or that that's applicable to your college list. And then, you know, in November, you're finalizing and submitting November 15th and December 1st applications. So December to February. Um, if you're accepted early decision, congratulations. You are done with this process except for following all the outlined instructions by the college. And that can include accepting your, um, your spot and then putting in your deposit and signing up for housing, letting all your recommenders know that you were accepted, and then patting yourself on the back and being really proud of yourself for getting this far in the process and getting into your early decision choice. Um, we hope that that's the case for all our students who choose to apply early decision. Um, in the event that it's not, you'll be re-strategizing. And that's also part of the process. Um, so if you are denied from your early decision or deferred, then it's a time to kind of take a step back and really re-strategize the college list. Hopefully the college list has been defined, keeping um, you know, regular schools in mind and that the student has been really writing all along the way so that it's not too much work to apply to the last round of schools. Um, we want for you to be finalizing and submitting those regular decision applications. Those deadlines range from January 1st, which is kind of rough when it comes to um, winter break and New Year's and all the holidays in between, but January 1st, um, and then application deadlines can go all the way until February. Um, and then you'll get those decisions usually February um, and March by end of March at the very latest. Um, we want for you to send continue it could in, continued interest letters if applicable. Keep your grades up. That is so, so important um, for so many reasons. And relax and enjoy the ride while you wait. This can be really tough to sit and wait and have to just kind of um, have no control over it, or it can at least feel like that. But that's, you know, trust me when I say that seniors across the world are doing the same thing as you, and it is part of the process. So try to keep your cool as much as you can. March to May, this is a really exciting time for students. Um, the UCs tend to be the last of the group to, uh, to release their admission decisions, and those come typically third to last week of March. And then that gives students the whole month of April to figure out where they want to go to college. Perhaps that means hopping on a plane and going to visit a school so that you feel really good about saying yes to that school. Um, it really kind of depends on the specific student and their individual outcomes. But we want for you to be celebrating all of your accomplishments, your hard work, thanking anybody who's helped you along the way. That really wonderful support system that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar, and of course, depositing by May 1st, reading the fine print, paying attention to all the announcements that are published in the student's portal and following through. Um, so, you know, final, final thoughts for today's webinar. Um, these next 10 weeks, really from, from now, um, September, October, all the way through mid-November mid into December, those are crucial. It's a lot of work. I really, really encourage you to carve out a couple hours each weekend devoted to your college applications, lean on your support system, and really try to break it up piece by piece. You know, every week have that punch list for yourself. Okay, this week I'm going to tackle um, 
five of my 15 supplemental essays that I need to work on. And you write them, and then you maybe have a trusted editor. You send those to the editor, you get the feedback, you revise, and then you move on to the next round. So getting a system in place and tackling it piece by piece is so crucial to being able to manage this process. Um, one thing I think students forget um, is take a minute and read your essays out loud. Make sure that it sounds good and that it sounds like you. Um, I also really caution you not to have too many cooks in the kitchen with your essays. Having one or two trusted editors is advisable um, because too many more, the authentic voice can get lost and we want for you to present yourself as authentically as possible. Um, we would also recommend that you do what's called a reverse admission analysis, which means that you are like, looking at your application and trying to make a sense of like, what does the admission professional actually get from me from this application? When the admission officer is reading my application, they understand X from my personal statement, Y from my activities list, and Z from my supplementals. Um, and then really getting a sense of like, is this the person I want to be um, presenting? Is this authentic to who I am as an individual? And if you can say yes, the match will happen. Um, this process has a lovely way of kind of working itself out where students, for the most part, really end up at their right fit school. And you, if you present yourself authentically, that will be the case for you as well. I really implore you not to compare the process to your peers. Any parents listening out there, please put boundaries up as you're you know, out to dinner with friends. It's so easy to start to talk about your kids and want to compare, but just... Do yourself a favor and don't um, because somebody tends to get hurt through that process. Um, and then for students listening, rely on the right adults. You know, think about that support system and really um, leverage it accordingly. So that is really all I have for today's webinar. This last slide pretty much outlines everything that I um, went over on a month by month basis and takes us all the way from now, um, September, all the way through May of the senior year. So um, I will end by putting my email address in the chat and um, feel free to email me any questions you have about the webinar and the recording will be made available on our website as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to answer a question if anybody wants to type something in the chat or um, ask. That's totally fine. If not, I will end by putting my email address in the chat. Any questions out there? Yes, looks like I got one question. And the question is, if you apply early in the Common App, can you go back and revise your personal statement? Yes, you can. Um, about maybe five years ago, they made that a possibility. Um, you used to have to create alternate versions of your common application if you wanted to edit a personal statement, for instance, that went out in the early round and then you wanted to change it for the regular. But now it's actually just a live application where you can make any changes. Um, so sometimes I'll actually have students who are 17 when they hit submit on an early round application, and then they have a birthday, say in December, and then they end up applying regular. And so they have to update their age and that's really easy to do. And then you can update anything with regards to personal statement as well. Great question. Anybody else? Any other questions out there? Okay. All right. My email is in the chat. So feel free to take that down. If you have any questions, please reach out and really appreciate everybody who showed up today and um, best of luck to seniors and parents and the whole support system around them. Take good care.